Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering priority and delegation in nursing. And I know what you're thinking, Professor D, you've made so many videos on priority and delegation. Why another one? Because NCLEX kills you with priority and delegation. Priority and delegation is weaved into psych, OB, PEDS, med surge, you name it. You guys have to have a strong foundation. Something I'm noticing, you guys understand the content. A lot of the times that you get the question wrong, it's not that you don't um, understand the pathophysiology of the patients or the nursing teaching. No, you don't understand which patient takes priority. You don't understand what you're allowed to delegate and what you're not. So that's why I'm killing you with priority and delegation. So just sit back and enjoy the video. But before we get started, guys, a couple things. If you haven't done so already, please do not forget to like and subscribe to this video. Press that red notification button so that every time a new video is released, you'll be notified. And lately, what I've started doing is actually teaching and providing lessons. I do that during the week. It's not scheduled. Um, if I have a little bit of free time, I just jump on and I do a teaching about whatever. Well, not whatever. I've actually been looking at the comments and subjects that people have been asking me for teaching on that's what i've been covering but those are sporadic so press that red notification button so when new videos released you'll know and of course the videos where i cover questions every week sunday 1 p.m eastern standard time you are guaranteed a video where i'm covering questions don't forget guys i have audio lessons available on my website and what pfft, i can't speak guys my website www.nexusnursinginstitute.com and of course, you can follow me across all social media platforms. I am on TikTok, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, and I just started a Twitter account, but I'm really not sure how to use Twitter, so we'll see how that goes, but I'm also on Twitter now as well. So uh, before we get started, guys, this is something I've been doing for a few months now. I pray before the session. If that's something you're not into, you can just fast forward, but those that want to participate, go ahead, uh, bow your uh, heads, close your eyes. Father God, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your protection, Jesus Christ. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for the breath of life that is in our bodies, Father God, that we're able to see another day, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father God, I ask for forgiveness for our sins. I know we should fall short of your glory every single moment, Jesus. But thank you, Lord, that the minute we open our mouths and we ask for forgiveness, it's already been freely given. And Lord, we tell you, thank you for that, Father God. Lord, I tell you, thank you for this, this opportunity that you've provided me, Father God, this platform that you've provided me to teach, to do what I love, Father God. And Lord, I ask that you please help me to deliver this information in a way that's palatable in a way that the students are able to digest and understand and absorb it, Father God, so that when they see this content again, Jesus Christ, they can recognize it, Father God, and they can answer these questions correctly. Lord, I pray for every single viewer, Jesus. They're here for a reason. And Lord, I ask that you please help them to meet their goals, Father God. Lord, I ask that you, that you, that you stand with them, Father God, and you help them, Jesus Christ, when they get discouraged and they don't want to study, Lord, I ask that you give them that strength to help them to keep pushing. And Father God, I tell you, thank you for the grace and mercy you've had over me, Lord. And Father God, I ask you for forgiveness for my sins because I know, Lord, I've been popping off on people in the comment section and that's not kind. So I ask you to please help me, Lord, be kinder, be more um, patient, be more compassionate and uh, more understanding, Father God. Please help me to ignore the things that I need to ignore and understand that I don't have to address every little thing. Thank you, Father God, for sticking with me through this struggle. I thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, well, let's get started. First question. The nurse is planning care of a client diagnosed with acute gastroenteritis. Which nursing problem is a priority? One, altered nutrition. Two, self-care three, impaired body image, or four, fluid and electrolyte imbalance? And guys, the correct answer is four, fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Remember guys, um, fluid and electrolyte imbalance, that is part of physiological integrity. Remember I told you, anything that falls under physiological integrity, that is always gonna take priority. So fluid, electrolytes, nutrition. Yes, nutrition's on the list. I'm gonna to talk to you guys about that in a second. Um, glucose, vital signs, hemodynamic status, 
cardiovascular status, um, ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation, all of those things fall under physiological status. So that those will be the things that you would address first in the patient. So I know what you're thinking. Well, Professor D, nutrition's on here as well. Why did we choose um, fluid electrolyte versus altered nutrition? Here's why. When you get two answer choices that are great, you have to say to yourself, out of these two, which one, excuse me guys, my nose is running. I think I'm allergic to makeup, but guess what? I'm not gonna stop. Um, which one will kill a patient faster? So when you're between altered nutrition and fluid and electrolyte imbalance, guys, when you look at altered nutrition, the patient can stay alive for weeks with their nutrition being decreased, right? But fluid and electrolyte imbalance, that will kill a patient much quicker. That can cause the patient to have immediate cardiac dysrhythmias. Patient can only live a couple days without fluids, right? So that's why whenever you get two or even three correct answers, between those correct answers, you have to say to yourself, which one is a priority? Which one's going to kill the patient faster? And the one that's going to kill the patient faster, that's going to be your priority. That's the patient you're going to run to. And that's why we chose number four over number one. Now look at choice two, self-care deficit. Okay, they can't take care of themselves, but they're still alive. You're still breathing, right? So that's not going to be a priority. And three, impaired body image. Okay, you don't like how you look, but you're still alive, right? So we got rid of two and three pretty easily. One and four should have been what you were between, and I just showed you how to choose the correct answer, okay? And guys, I want you to use that principle moving forward. Next question. The nurse is preparing to administer morning medications to clients on a medical unit. Which medication should the nurse administer first? One, methylprednisone, a steroid to a client diagnosed with COPD. Two, the nepazil, Aricet, an acetylcholesterolase inhibitor to a client with dementia. Three, sulfate, carafate, a mucosal barrier agent to a client diagnosed with ulcer disease. Or four, enoxaparin, levonox, an anticoagulant to a client on bed rest after hip surgery. And guys, the correct answer is three, the sucrophate. And I know what you're thinking. Well, you know, sucrophate, that's, you know, it's a barrier agent. It coats the stomach so the patient does have gastric ulcers. Well, you know, that's not something acute. But look at this, guys. Sucrophate, when does it have to be given? Before meals. I just told you it lines, it coats the patient's stomach. So it has to be there to form a barrier before meals. You have to give that patient um that medication to the patient before meals. Now I know what tried to trick you, the one with the COPD. Let's go to the other choices. You have one, the steroid to a client with COPD. It's a steroid to a client with COPD. There's nothing in there that tells us the patient's having an acute exacerbation. And if the patient was having an acute exacerbation, by the way, steroid isn't what, what we would have been given. This steroid that we're giving to the client with COPD, this is for what? This is for uh, maintenance. This is something that's chronic, not something that's acute. So this is not something that would immediately affect the patient like that mucosal barrier would because they absolutely have to have that before meals. That would immediately affect the patient. Choice number two, um, the nepazil, the aricet to a patient with dementia. Again, that's something that's what? Maintenance. That's not something that is acutely happening that we have to deal with right now. Choice number four, the Lovenox. Absolutely, you have to give that to the patient, but that's not something acute. But that um, mucosal barrier, that is time sensitive. You absolutely must give that to the patient before they eat, because remember what it does. It coats the lining of that patient's stomach. So then when that patient eats and they start making hydrochloric acid, that hydro, <coughs> excuse me, that hydrochloric acid that their own stomach is making doesn't burn a hole in their stomach and we don't have that patient bleeding out from that hole in the stomach. It's a domino effect, okay? So do not be tricked as students. I see this all the time. The minute you see something that has to, to do with airway, you choose it even if it doesn't make sense. Guess what? The test writers know this as well. That's why they want you to use critical thinking. You're not a robot. It has to make sense, okay? And so, guys, that's why number three is the correct answer. Next question. The nurse is completing a head-to-toe assessment of a client diagnosed with breast cancer and notes a systolic murmur that the nurse was not informed of during the report. 
which action should the nurse implement first? One, notify the healthcare practitioner about the new cardiac complication. Two, document the finding in the client's chart and tell the charge nurse. Three, ch check the chart to determine whether this is the first time her members have been identified. Or four, ask the client whether she has ever been told she has an abnor abnormal heartbeat. And Kai, Kai, guys, the correct answer is three. You're going to check the chart. ADPI, assessment, diagnosis, planning, intervention, evaluation. The first thing of ADPI is what? Assessment. Ask questions. Go through a chart. Do a history. Okay? Number three is the correct answer because wouldn't you look like a fool? calling the doctor about a murmur that we all were already aware of. You just didn't happen to get it during the report. But if you bothered to do your assessment, you would have known, right? So the first thing you're going to do is gather information. As students, I don't know why in your mind you think assessment is physically looking at your patient doing a physical assessment. That is not the only assessment there is. Anything that gets you information, whether it's asking questions, going to a chart, that is a form of assessment. That's the first thing you're going to do. Let's look at the other choices. Um, so I told you why number one's wrong. Two, document the finding in the client's charge chart until the uh, until the charge nurse. Well, the first part is wrong. Wrong. The first part is right. If you hear a murmur, document it. That's part of your assessment. But why would you tell the charge nurse about that murmur when number one, we already knew about that murmur if you bothered to check the chart? Or number two, let's say we didn't know about that murmur. This murmur is new. We, yes, we were documented, but who would we contact? The physician, not the charge nurse. And this is how they trick you guys. They will give you an answer where half or part of the answer is right and everything is wrong. And they want you to choose that wrong answer. No. If the whole thing, 100% of that answer choice is not correct, the whole thing, 100% of that answer choice is wrong. Don't choose it. Don't fall for it. It's a trick. So that's wrong. And then you have four, ask the client whether she's ever been told she has an abnormal heartbeat. How does that help us in the situation? How does that help us, number one, know if, this has been documented. Do we know about this? Is there something I need to do? Do I need to call the physician? How does that help us? And number two, you're just making that patient nervous because number one, maybe the patient didn't know about the murmur. Now you got them all scared and nervous and the doctor hasn't even been notified. Or number two, yeah, they know they haven't had a murmur. The last two nurses before this patient knew they had a murmur and now you don't know. You think that patient's going to have confidence in you? How do you not know? Because you didn't do your homework. You didn't go through the, through the patient's chart, right? So you always want to assess. Let me tell you guys something. The only time when you get a question and you don't do an assessment, you jump to an intervention, is if in the body of the question, they let you know you did an assessment. Now, they're not going to come straight out and say, oh, you assessed the patient or, oh, you went through the chart. But no, they will give you certain information that the only way you would have that information was if you assessed your patient or if you did the history or if you went into the patient chart. You did something to garner that information and you now have enough information to perform an intervention. That's the only time you jump from an assessment to intervention when you're answering test questions. Okay, guys? Next question. A major disaster has been called and the charge nurse on a medical unit must recommend clients to be discharged to the medical discharge officer on rounds. Which client should not be discharged? One, the client diagnosed with chronic angina pectoris who's been on new medication for two days. Two, the client diagnosed with DVT who has had heparin discontinued and has been on wharf and Coumadin for four days. Three, the client with an infected leg wound who's receiving Venco IV piggyback every 24 hours for MRSA infection or for the client diagnosed with COPD who has the following arterial blood gas levels. The pH is 7.34, the PCO2 is 55, the bicarb is 28, the partial pressure of oxygen is 89. And the correct answer is number three. 
the client who has infected leg who's receiving Vango IV piggyback every day for MRSA. So let's go back to the question because the question's asking us which one would we not discharge. That's another way of asking us which patient is the priority, which one is the one that can die the fastest because that's the one we have to hold on to. Now let's look at number three. Patients got infected leg and they're getting what? Vanco. Guys, Vanco is the big guns. We pull Vanco out when nothing else is working, right? None of the other antibiotics are working. Vanco is the big gun. So if a patient's on Vanco, they're in a very serious condition. So that was our first hint that, ooh, this patient's in trouble. They're on Vanco. They're getting an IV piggyback every day for MRSA which is like resistant to everything under the sun. We don't want this patient to get worse. We don't want this patient to end up getting a septic infection. So that is the patient who is uh, worse off right now because that's the patient who can die the quickest. Let's look at our other choices. One, the client diagnosed with chronic, not acute, there's not something going on with them right now, chronic, okay? Chronic angina, pectoris, who's been on a new medication. And that word new, that's supposed to scare you because you're like, okay, something's new, but let's keep going. New medication for how long? Two days. They've been on this medication for two days. We've had two days of monitoring them. Choice uh, two, the client with DVT. Okay, we're concerned about the DVT who had heparin discontinued. Okay, they had heparin discontinued. We're worried. We don't want them to get a clot. But look, but they've been on Coumadin for four days. And guys, that's what bridge therapy is. We're going to DC them off the heparin and start them on the Coumadin. That's the bridge therapy because heparin starts working immediately, but Coumadin takes a couple of days. It's been four days, okay? And then choice four, the client diagnosed with COPD. Look at these blood gases. Guess what? These blood gases, I expect to see this on a patient with COPD. They're holding on to more of that carbon dioxide. So I expect to see um, these type of blood gases and the patient's gonna be sent home on oxygen, low dose oxygen, but they'll be sent home on oxygen. That patient who's most likely to die out of this list that we've been given is definitely that patient with the MRSA who's on Venco. So that's the patient we're going to keep. We have to monitor them. We cannot discharge that patient yet. So that's why number three is our correct answer. The client diagnosed with cerebrovascular accident, CVA, has residual right-sided hemiparesis and difficulty swallowing, but is scheduled for discharge. Which referral is most appropriate for the case manager to make at this time? One, inpatient rehab unit, two, home health care agency, three, long-term care facility, or four, outpatient therapy center. And guys, the correct answer is one inpatient rehab unit. This patient is going to need intense physical therapy, occupational therapy. They need may need speech therapy because they got that swallowing uh, issue, right? So they need intense therapy. We're going to put them in an in inpatient rehab. You see choices two, three, and four, they're not intense enough. Not for this type of patient that had a stroke. They have right-sided hemiparesis and difficulty swallowing. Do we want that patient to aspirate, choke, and die? No, they need intense therapy. That's why number one is the correct answer. The nurse and LPN are caring for a client diagnosed with a stroke. Which intervention should the nurse, del excuse me, should the nurse assign to the LPN? One, feed the client who's being allowed to eat for the first time. Two, administer the client's anticoagulant subcutaneously. Three, check the client's neurologic signs and limb movement. Or four, teach the client to turn the head and tuck the chin to swallow. And guys, the correct answer is two, giving the anticoagulant sub-Q. Let me tell you something. As an RN, you cannot delegate anything that you can eat. E-A-T. E, evaluate. A, assess. Or T, teach. Anything that requires evaluation, monitoring, assessment, teaching, you have to keep that type of patient. Okay, what you're going to delegate to the LPN are going to be routine meds. Okay, the least acute patient, the most stable patient, the maintenance medication, the maintenance type of patients, those are the patients that you're going to give to the LPN. So let's look at the choices. One, feeding the patient, well, 
What's wrong with that? Feeding the patient who's allowed to eat what? For the first time. Excuse me, but after a patient has a stroke, we have to make sure that they don't have any swallowing deficits because we don't want them to aspirate. So the first time that they're eating after a stroke, the RN has to do it. Why? Because while you're feeding that patient, you're assessing them. You're looking to see, are they coughing? Um, are they having difficulty swallowing? Because if they do, you, the RN, you have to call the doctor and ask for a speech evaluation. Because with that speech evaluation, they do that swallow study. They see if the patient has any difficulty swallowing. But you, the RN, has to ask the doctor for that. And in order to ask the doctor for that, don't you have to tell the doctor what you witnessed? That um, When you're feeding that patient for the first time, it requires an in-depth assessment. You, the RN, has to do that. Um, where were we? Choice number three, checking the client's neural status, uh, signs, excuse me, and limb movement. That's the in-depth assessment. The RN has to keep that. Four, teaching. Stop right there. The RN has to do that. And that's not to say that the LPN doesn't assess. They don't teach. But the in-depth, the first time assessment and teaching has to come from the RN. Okay? The LPN comes behind the RN and does it. So that's why giving the anticoagulant sub Q, this is a uh, routine med. There's nothing acutely that's happening with the patient that says the RN has to keep it. The nurse is caring for a client diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, which nursing tasks should not be delegated to the unlicensed assistive personnel. Select all that applies. Guys, how do we treat select all that apply as true or false? Don't try to lump them together for it to make sense. Go through each line. If it's true, you keep it. And if it's false, you throw it away. So the question is, which one would we not give to an unlicensed assistive personnel? One, checking the client's skin under restraints true. We would not give that to an unlicensed assistive personnel. Why? Because that requires what? Assessment. You need to look at that skin and see if it's retin, see if there are any lesions, right? You do that assessment. Two, administer the client's antipsychotic medication. True. We would not delegate that to an unlicensed assistive personnel. An unlicensed... Un <clears throat> Guys, you know I can't speak. Forgive me. An unlicensed person... Can they give medications? No, you would not delegate that to a UAP. So that's why that's true. Three, perform the morning's hygiene care. True, you can delegate that to a UAP. Brushing their teeth, brushing their hair, helping them get dressed. Four, ambulating the client to the bathroom. True, you can ambulate. You can ambulate. You can delegate that to a UAP. They're just helping the patient walk to the bathroom. Now, if it said something about, you know, the patient had a stroke and this is their first time walking, then no, you're not going to give that to a UAP. You, the RN, would keep that type of patient because this is their first time walking. You have to assess them to see, whoa, you know, this patient's having difficulties. I have to call the doctor and ask for a physical therapy evaluation to see if maybe the patient needs a walker or a cane or a wheelchair or whatever, right? But simply walking to the bathroom and within that context of this situation, there's nothing else we know about the patient. They're just walking to the bathroom. Yes, you can give that to a UAP. Here's how you guys get in trouble. In your mind, you're like, oh, what if this patient just had a stroke? Or, oh, what if this patient just had leg surgery? Or, oh, what if, what if, what if? That's how you get in trouble. The minute you start saying what if and you turn into Daniel Steele, a book writer, you got the question wrong. You have to always assume you're given enough information to answer the question. And all they said to you was ambulating the client to the bathroom with nothing else. So yes, a UAP can do that. And then choice five, taking the client's vital signs. Of course, UAPs can record and report. They can record the uh, vital signs and then report them to the nurse. They can record the um, INO and report it to the nurse. They can record the patient's glucose and report it to the nurse. They absolutely can record and report. What they cannot do is assess. They cannot uh, um, evaluate. They cannot teach. All right. So one and two is the correct answer. Next question. The client diagnosed with lung cancer has, the H has an H and H 
of 13.4 and 40.1 WBC 7800 neutrophil count 62 percent which actions should the nurse implement one place the client in reverse isolation to notify the health care provider three make sure no flowers are taking the patient's room or four continue to monitor the client and guys, the correct answer is four. We hardly ever see this. We always want to do something, right? But this is one of the few situations, there's nothing wrong. Everything's within normal limits. So you're just going to continue to monitor the client, okay? Next question. The nurse has been named in a lawsuit concerning the care provided. Which action should the nurse take first? One, consult with the hospital's attorney. Two, review the client's chart. Three, purchase personal liability insurance. Four, discuss the case with the supervisor. And guys, the, the correct answer is two, review the patient's chart. Before you get an attorney, before you do anything else, look at your documentation. Do you think three, four, five years from now, you're going to remember that patient? You're going to remember what you did for that patient? You're going to remember the situation? Review the documentation. Review the client's chart. Add pie. Assessment. Get information. Now, let's look at the wrong answers. One, consult with the hospital's attorney and tell them what? You haven't even reviewed the client's chart. What are you going to tell them? What information are you going to provide? So you may get an attorney. I wouldn't suggest the hospital's attorney. I suggest you get your own, but whatever. You may get an attorney, but you have to have something to tell the t attorney. The first thing that you're going to do, guys, is check the patient's chart. Three, purchase personal liability insurance. Too late. Any liability insurance you get now is going to be for now moving forward, but it's not retroactive. It's not going to cover you back when you saw that patient. Um, choice four, discuss the case with the supervisor. You do not discuss this case with anyone that may possibly be called in to be a witness against you or to be a witness period where their words may be used against you. Let me tell you something. Loose lips sink ships. We don't play those type of games over here. Okay. What are we going to do? We're going to look at our charting and get a lawyer and keep our, our lips zipped. And the only time we're going to speak is when our attorney tells us to speak. As a matter of fact, before we even speak, if the attorney tells you you can answer that question, you better whisper your answer to your attorney first. Let your attorney give you a thumbs up before you give your answer. Loose lips sink ships. Don't say I didn't warn you. So anyway, guys, the correct answer is number two. We are going to check the patient's chart. That's the first thing you're going to do. Um, be reminded of what happened before you take any other steps. The nurse has accepted the position of clinical manager for a medical surgical unit. Which role is an important aspect of this management position? One, evaluate the job performance of the staff. Two, be able to, excuse me, be the sole decision maker for the unit. Three, take responsibility for the staff, nurse's actions, or four, attend the medical staff meetings. And guys, the correct answer is one, evaluate the job performance of the staff. That is the only correct answer out of all these choices that have been given to us. Look at the wrong choices, guys. Look at two, be the sole. That word sole as an S-O-L-E, that's another word for only. Did not tell you to stay away from all inclusive, such as only, always, never, and not to choose those unless you know that you know that you know that's the answer, and this is not the answer. Look at number two. It says, be the only, be the sole decision maker for the unit. No, this is not a dictatorship. Absolutely not. You know that's not right. Three, take responsibility for staff nurses' actions. Really? So as a clinical manager, you're going to take responsibility for a nurse's mistake? For a nurse's med error? No, absolutely not. That's false. And then choice four, attend the medical staff meetings. Why? Medical, medical staff meetings are for the physicians, for the nurse practitioners, for the physician assistants. The medical staff meetings are the meetings for those who are actually uh, um, writing medical orders. Does that make sense? So the only correct answer there is number one, evaluating the job performance of the staff that's working under your direction. The charge nurse notices that one of the staff members takes frequent breaks, has unpredictable mood swings, and often volunteers to care for patients who require narcotics. 
which priority action should the charge nurse implement regarding this employee? One, discuss the nurse's actions with the unit manager. Two, confront the nurse about the behavior. Three, do not allow the nurse to take breaks alone. Or four, prepare an occurrence report on the employee. And guys, the correct answer is one, discuss the nurse's actions with the unit manager. Remember, if you have a personal issue with someone else, another professional, it's personal, it has nothing to do with patient care, you're going to talk to that person. You're going to go to them first to see if you can resolve it. But if patient safety is involved, you go up the chain of command. So if you're a nurse, you're going to go to the nursing supervisor. If you're the nursing supervisor, you're going to go to the nurse manager, excuse me, or the unit manager. You're going to go up the chain of command. And that's why number one is the correct answer. Two, confront. Let's stop right there. Do you ever confront anybody? No. So that's wrong. Three, do not allow the uh, nurse to take breaks alone. First of all, that's illegal. And second of all, how does that solve the situation of keeping your patients safe that their narcotics are not being diverted? Choice or patients being cared for a uh, nurse that's under the influence. Choice four, prepare an occurrence report on an employee. What occurrence? This situation has not even been addressed where there's been an investigation. What is the occurrence that you're gonna be making? So guys, the correct answer is number one. The graduate nurse is working with an unlicensed assistive personnel who's been an employee of the hospital for 12 years. However, tasks delegated to the UAP by the graduate nurse are frequently not completed. Which action should the graduate nurse take first? One, tell the charge nurse the UAP will not do tasks as delegated by the nurse. Two, write up a counseling record with objective data and give it to the manager. Three, complete the delegated task and do nothing about the insubordination. Or four, address the UAP to discuss why tasks are not being done as requested. And guys, the correct answer is four. You're going to address the UAP, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to address the UAP to discuss why the tasks are not being, um, uh, excuse me, done. What? I can't speak. Why the tasks are not being done as requested. Assessment. Get information first. Find out what's going on. Maybe there's a miscommunication. Maybe you're saying something and the UAP is thinking, well, you meant something else. Maybe the UAP's head is just not in the game. They're going through a divorce. The husband just left them. The kids are acting up. Whatever it is. But the first thing you're going to do is address it with the UAP first. Now, something I want you to notice. There's nothing in here that lets us know that the patients are in danger. That, you know, may, maybe that UAP is drunk or taking drugs or uh, um, doing something to put the patient in danger. What it's saying is, you know, they're just not really completing those tasks. So you're going to address the UAP first. And then if it doesn't get resolved, you moved up, you move up the chain of command. Okay. And guys, we are down to our very last question. The nurse is preparing to administer medications to client on a medical unit. Which medication should the nurse question administering? One, level thyroxine, a thyroid hormone, to a client diagnosed with hypothyroidism. Two, propanolol, a beta adrenergic, to a client diagnosed with hyperthyroidism. Three, nifedipine, a calcium channel blocker, to a client with hypotension. Or four, alanoprol, an ACE inhibitor, to a client with diabetes. And guys, the correct answer is three. Nifedipine, a calcium channel blocker to a client with hypotension. Go back to the question. The question says, which medication should the nurse question administering? Whenever you get test question asking you, which would you question? What they're really asking you, which one is the wrong answer? Which one would you not do? And it's number three. Why would we give a calcium channel blocker, which lowers the patient's blood pressure, to a patient with hypotension, their blood pressure is already low. Are we trying to throw them into shock? Are we trying to make their organs collapse? Absolutely not. Do we want to throw them into hypotensive crisis? So yes, we would question that. You guys, you can't be a robot. You cannot give a medication just because the doctor ordered it. Patient's hypotensive and the doctor wants to, you to give a calcium channel blocker. You're going to withhold that medication 
and place a phone call to the doctor and say, hey, I know you ordered this, but this is what's going on with the patient. And the doctor says, well, I don't care. Give it anyway. You tell them to come down on the floor and give it themselves because you're not losing your license. Not today, not on my shift. So you're going to question that order. One, two, and four are wonderful. Giving a thyroid hormone to a patient with hypothyroidism, that's great. Three, giving a beta adrenergic to a patient with hyperthyroidism, wonderful. Four, giving an ACE inhibitor to a patient with um, diabetes, absolutely, why? And I know what you're thinking, you're like, okay, ACE inhibitors, that's for hypertension. This patient has diabetes, why would, give it? why would we give it? ACE inhibitors are good for what? Diabetic neuropathy. So if the patient has diabetes, the chance very high that they have diabetic neuropathy and ACE has been proven to help um, help with diabetic neuropathy or to let me be more specific because I'm saying helping with diabetic helps prevent diabetic neuropathy. So let me back that up. So it really does it treat the diabetic neuropathy. It's been shown, studies have shown that it helps to prevent diabetic neuropathy. And as you know, guys, patients with diabetes, if they have diabetes long enough, there's a very high risk that they'll develop diabetic neuropathy. So ACE inhibitors are wonderful to help prevent the development of diabetic neuropathy. So um, that's that. Oh, guys, I'm out of time. Okay, I'm doing one more question. That's it. One more question and then I got to go. The nurse has received the shift report. Which client should the nurse assess first? One, client diagnosed with DVT who's complaining of dyspnea and coughing. Two, client diagnosed with gallbladder ulcer disease who refuses to eat the food served. Three, client diagnosed with pancreatitis who wants the NG tube removed. Or four, the client diagnosed with osteoarthritis who's complaining of stiff joints. And remember... When they ask us, who do we see first? What they really mean is who's in most danger of dying the quickest. One, that patient with a DVT, a DVT that's complaining of dyspnea and coughing. <gasps> what do we suspect? We suspect that DVT has dislodged, has gone to their lungs, and now that patient has a pulmonary embolism, which is fatal, it's lethal, it's deadly. This is the patient who's in danger the mo most. That's who we're going to run to. Choices two, three, and four, that's not deadly. Yes, you need to address it, but their life is not in danger like choice number one is. That's why we're seeing that patient first. Okay, guys, that is the end. I hope you guys found this video to be helpful. Please, guys, don't forget... I get comments from you all the time about how grateful and thankful you are for my videos. If you're truly grateful and thankful, share my content, post a video or two on your social media platform. Maybe there's somebody who is thinking about the nursing program or they're in the nurse. You'd be surprised how many people are in the nursing program and they don't tell anyone because they're scared that they're going to fail out. And if they do fail, they don't want anyone to know. So it's like their little secret, but they're struggling. And my video might be something to help them. So please post my video on your social media platform or share my video with a friend or coworkers. Don't forget to guys, like and subscribe below to my video and check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And don't forget guys, I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. That's the end of this video guys. And you'll see me on the next video.